please an honor to open the present session of meeting with an author, during which my colleague, Dr. Galia Janoszewski from the Department of French Culture, will discuss with Mr. Bettina Ditti and Professor Evan Fallenberg on identity and migration. This encounter, made in collaboration with the Department of English, Literature and Linguistics, is held in the framework of the 2014 Francophonie Map. Mr. Metina Aditi, the guest of honor of the Swiss Embassy in Israel on the occasion of the Francophonie Map, is a Swiss writer of Turkish origin. Professor Fallenberg, from the Department of English Literature and Linguistics, is an Israeli writer and translator of American origin. The Department of French Culture is grateful to its partners, the Swiss Embassy and the French Embassy in Israel, and the French Institute in Tel Aviv for enabling this exceptional encounter. We extend our sincere thanks to both Mr. Arditi and Professor Fallenberg for this opportunity to learn from you today what it means to be a writer. French follows. Bonjour à tous et bienvenue au département de culture française de l'Université Paris. Je suis particulièrement euh, ravie d'ouvrir la présente séance de rencontre avec un écrivain lors de laquelle ma collègue, le docteur Galia Yanoszewski du département de culture française, euh, euh, s'entretiendra avec M. Bettine Arditi et le professeur Evan Fallenberg autour de la question de l'identité et de la migration. Cette rencontre, montée en collaboration avec le département de littérature et de linguistique anglaise de l'Université Barilane, s'inscrit dans le cadre du mois de la francophonie 2014. Monsieur Metin Arditi, l'invité d'honneur de l'ambassade de Suisse dans le cadre du mois de la francophonie 2014, est un écrivain suisse d'origine turque. Le professeur Fallenberg, du département de littérature et linguistique anglaise, est écrivain et traducteur israélien d'origine américaine. Le département de culture française désire exprimer sa gratitude à ses partenaires, l'ambassade de Suisse et l'ambassade de France en Israël, ainsi que l'Institut français de Tel Aviv, pour avoir permis cette rencontre exceptionnelle. Notre gratitude va encore à M. Arditi et au professeur Fallenberg pour l'opportunité d'apprendre ce que signifie être un écrivain. Chers collègues, la parole est à vous. Dear colleagues, the floor is yours. Merci beaucoup Sylvia. Euh, merci, tout le monde. merci beaucoup tout le monde d'être venu. Euh, je vais passer tout de suite à l'anglais. Euh, mais je voudrais tout d'abord remercier ce, cet immense projet donc, de la francophonie, du mois de la francophonie, euh, qui est une espèce de collaboration entre les, les différentes ambassades francophones euh, du pays. C'est un mois extrêmement intensif euh, au cours duquel euh, on a eu de la chance, de, en fait on a de la chance d'accueillir chez nous un écrivain d'expression française. Et euh, donc euh, merci beaucoup à tous pour tout pour tout cet effort. Euh, on est très enchanté euh, de pouvoir accueillir un écrivain euh, francophone. Or, la réalité veut qu'on euh, voudrait euh, ouvrir l'événement à d'autres étudiants, professeurs et intéressés euh, au Confus. Et c'est pour ça qu'on va euh, euh, discuter en anglais, mais on va passer de l'anglais en, en, au français et vice-versa. Euh, J'espère que ça ne vous ne dérangera pas trop. Euh, en tout cas, vous pouvez, j'espère bien, vous pouvez poser les, les questions dans toutes les langues confondues, donc euh, français, anglais, euh, hébreu, euh, c'est à peu près les langues que je peux traduire. Et euh, voilà. Donc, et merci aussi, pour ne pas oublier, euh, le département de français, le département d'anglais bien sûr, mais euh, dans le cadre du département de français, Sylvia, euh, directrice du département, et... Euh, notre chère secrétaire Chosh, qui n'est pas là, je ne la vois pas, mais c'est grâce à elle qu'on peut organiser des événements de ce genre. Merci à tous. Et euh, je voudrais donc euh, commencer par euh, la présentation de nos invités. I would like to, uh, to present, to introduce our um, guests, first of all. Um, I'll do that in English. I'll say something about their lives, their uh, CV or bio lives as authors. Um, and then I'd like to say a little word to my students because we are in, we're all hosting you in, the, in uh, the framework of my class on writers and other media. And these two authors I'm pleased to um, host today are authors of a different kind. 
So um, I'd have to say a word about that too. But let me first start with our honorable guests. Um, first of all, uh, Mr. Metin Arditi um, has had a very, very interesting life which didn't at all start in literature. Uh, he's a graduate of um, the, the, business of the School of Business in Stanford University. Um, he has also studied nuclear engineering and physics in the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology where he was a, an assistant in physics and lecturer. And many years later, he was a visiting professor there in creative writing from 2008 to 2011. Ever since, he has not, um, as we say in Hebrew, shakat al shmarav, he has not remained without work. He has been with McKinsey and Co. doing business. And um, other than business, he's also been very active in philanthropic and civic activities. Um, Gee, there's so many things. <laughs> Maybe I'll just mention your most exotic activity, which is uh, being the co-founder and chairman with Elias Sanbao of the Instruments for Peace Foundation. And maybe you can say a word about that uh, later on. Okay, and um, his writing career is absolutely prof uh, prolific with um, a career spanning almost two decades, I think, with um, 15, about 15 novels. Um, I have the whole list here, a few novels here on the table. Let me just say that, for instance, uh, for his 2011 novel, Le Turquetto, uh, by Actes Sud, Edition Actes Sud Arles, he has received 16 prizes altogether, 16 literary prizes. So if we're speaking about the sociology of literature, <laughs> this is one, 16, is that? 26. 26, oh, you've only listed 16, I'm uh, sorry. I'm modest. <laughs> <laughs> only half modest. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. And, and, and these are all very prestigious prices, too. Uh, so let's just say that from a sociolog sociological point of view, he's a, a ce qu'on appelle en français un écrivain reconnu dans le champ littéraire. No. Um, so uh, today he's agreed to uh, talk to us about his latest novel published with his new editor Grasset à Paris. I've, I've uh, seen un other interviews with you where you said you were absolutely happy with Actes Sud but then you changed to Grasset. For those who don't know Grasset, it's one of the uh, better maison d'édition editors uh, in France. So La Confrérie des Moines Volants, uh, The Brotherhood of the Flying Priests, is that a... Flying Monks. Monks, sorry. Is that a, an okay translation? And um, and so he will speak to us about this, amongst others. Um, is that a fair presentation? Perfect. <laughs> okay. I will now pass on to our second honorable guest, uh, Professor Evan Fallenberg, who also happens to be my colleague from the English department. And so Evan is an Ohio-born writer and translator who has lived in Israel since 1985. Have you spoken Hebrew longer than that? No. No, okay, so uh, ever since 90, 1985. He is the author of Light Fell by Soho Press in 2008, and When We Danced on Water uh, at Harper Collins, 2011. This is the novel we will be speaking about, but Evan has told me, it's not written here, has told me that he has already another novel written and about to be published, and a fourth one coming up. So maybe we can talk about that too. His Recent translations, I said he was a translator too, include Meir Shalev's A Pigeon and a Boy, um, winner of the 2007 National Jewish Book Award for fiction, Ron Leshem's Beaufort, Alon Hilou's Death of a Monk, and Batya Gul's, one of my favorite uh, writers, Murder in Jerusalem. Uh, he's a graduate of the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and the MFA program in creative writing at Vermont College. Even, um, and now, Evan is serving as a coordinator of literary translation in the Department of English Literature at Bar-Ilan University here, and he's responsible for a new MA track in literary translation. Also, another thing you need to know about Evan is that when he's not teaching here, he's an instructor and 
mentor in low residency MFA writing program at, you'll never guess. City University of Hong Kong. Okay. <laughs> so, it's an uh, easy commute. So <laughs> we have here uh, two rather international uh, persons. One of the first thing, things we need to clarify is the question of identity, right? But um, we'll come to that later. So um, the first thing I would like to do today is um, say something about this class before we turn on to present the two novels, and actually when we do the presenting, we'll do them through the voices of the writers themselves. I'd just like to say one word which will probably uh, represent a certain challenge for both of you. And I hope it's not too aggressive on my part, you'll, you'll tell me. Uh, so when, when I conceived this class, um, I called it Writers and Other Media, Les Écrivains Face aux Autres Médias. And why? Because I thought to myself that it was about time to show students that writers are not people who only write. Writers also produce and create through other media, through internet, through uh, music, uh, through, um, through experience with substances, for instance. And so uh, when I conceived this class to uh, host only writers that do other things. And then came up this amazing uh, suggestion or proposition by, by, the, um, by the Swiss embassy to host Metina Arditi. And at first I said, well, how am I going to go about it? It has really nothing to do with this class. But then when I started thinking about it, and as soon as I read Metina Arditi and, uh, and Evan Fallenberg, I thought that it would be an excellent idea for our students to see, to remember what writing is about. So here's my challenge to you. When, when thinking about what writing is ever since the 60s or the 70s, um, writers, and I'm referring specifically to writers and theori theoreticians of the new novel, and then in theory to structuralists, they said something about killing the author, death of the author, about replacing the author by the text itself, by the readers. And when they referred to characters, those characters that are so lively in your own text, and you will soon come to them, we'll soon meet them, um, they called them empty shells. <laughs> Nathalie Sarot, in her The Age of Suspicion, L'Ère du Soupçon, um, says something like, uh, when the can writer, you read it, can you read it in, in French, French of so course. that I understand yes, yes. exactly what fight. she means? Yes. Let me just find the passage now. I should have marked it. It's in L'air du soupçon. Take me. Uh, well, we may need it in yes. English. Yeah, too, I'll, I'll, so. I'll read it. I'll first read it in English. It's a very, very short, uh, short, short passage, and then I'll, I'll find the French one. Okay, so it goes. He says, and when, when the writer looks around, he's obliged to admit that he sees nothing, in what they bring back, but large, empty carcasses. These men, whom he would so like to know and make known. When he tries to show them, show the characters, montrer les personnages, uh, about in the blinding light of the day, seem to him to him to be nothing but well-made dolls, intended for the amusement of children. Donc les personnages que l'auteur voudrait construire, voilà, Claude va trouver le passage. Elle est plus rapide que moi. <laughs> euh, C'est vrai. Euh, donc les personnages que l'écrivain voudrait construire deviennent des, des carcasses vides, empty shells. Et and when he tries to put life into them, lorsqu'il essaye de leur donner vie, ben ça devient des, des, des poupées euh, pour amuser les enfants. The writer is no longer able to produce characters. Now, she wrote this in 56, or in 50, in the 50s. And yet, when I read 
in the, in the year 2014, when I read your novels, your characters were so live that I could not help thinking about them as though they were people I, I had just met after closing the book. So here it is. Um, here is my question. How do you... How do you go about being a writer? How do you go about inventing characters in face of all those people who, um, who claim that the characters are, they can no longer exist? Um, but first, perhaps, and may I ask you to read uh, a passage from your book so we can talk about those characters. <laughs> OK. This is uh, from La Confrérie des Moines Volants. And uh, in this very short chapter, uh, my character is Ivan Karazin. That takes place in year 2000, that is to say about 10 years. It takes place in Russia, and it has been 10 years that Russia is not USSR anymore. And obviously this character, has a, a deep nostalgia about the Soviet Union and uh, for having been in Russia a number of times to write this book I can tell you that he's not the only one he's a specific character he's a violent man he used to be a boxer but what he what he thinks is, is largely shared by a major portion of the population. That is to say that the old regime took more or less good care about more or less everybody, whereas the new regime gives opportunities for a few to become extremely rich and leaves on the side of the road the majority of the population. Ivan Karazin n'était ni la télévision d'un geste brusque. Ce commentateur n'était qu'un imbécile et un menteur. Qu'est-ce qu'il en savait de la tenue exceptionnelle de nos athlètes à Sydney? He is referring to the Olympic Games in Sydney. Est-ce qu'on ne leur apprenait pas l'arithmétique dans leurs écoles de journalisme? 88 aux dernières nouvelles. Ça faisait moins que 97 aux dernières nouvelles. La comparaison chiffrée l'apaisa. Il aimait compter, même à l'école. Nul partout, mais bon en chiffres. Les chiffres, c'était du solide, du dur, comme la boxe. Un chiffre, c'était un chiffre, point final. Et 88, ça faisait toujours moins que 97 soupira. C'était fini la grande époque, lorsque URSS était un nom synonyme de puissance, de gloire, un nom pas très aimé forcément, mais respecté. L'époque où l'hymne national russe était une ritournelle aux Jeux Olympiques. Il se mit à fredonner d'une voix de basse. Mais il s'arrêta après quelques notes. L'hymne national, c'était sacré. On ne le fredonnait pas à la légère. 97 médailles pour les Américains. Tout était dit. Le pays allait au diable, point final. À Rome, en 60, c'était 103 à 71, mais dans l'autre sens, 43 médailles d'or. Les Américains en avaient obtenu 34. L'URSS, 43. Au total, 103 à 71. Pas besoin d'explication. Et ils auraient pu aller à 104. Combien de fois n'avait-il pas revécu la scène en 40 40 fois 300 jours par an en chiffreront, cela faisait 12 000. Donc, avec 365 jours par an, en gros, 15 000. 
disons qu'il repensait à la scène 20 fois par jour. Résultat, 300 000. Il avait donc revécu la scène 300 000 fois. Deuxième reprise, he's talking about his boxing game. Deuxième reprise et une erreur de gamin. Impardonnable. Il avait la médaille de bronze autour du cou. Quarté, c'était un enfant de cœur comparé à lui. Beau spécimen, mais enfant de cœur quand même. Une feinte et la médaille lui fait la nuit. Et quelle feinte D'un coup, voilà que Quarté se met en fausse garde. Ce crétin de Quarté, il le blouse à 1 minute 30 de la fin du combat par une fausse garde. Le temps qu'il comprenne ce qui se passe, Quarté lui file un direct du gauche et l'envoie au tapis. Comptez à 10 comme un bleu. Il soupira. Il était 100 fois plus fort que le Ghanéen. 1000 fois sur le plan technique, plus encore que sur le plan physique. Cela dit, sur le plan physique, il n'avait rien à lui envier. Rien de rien. Il se souvint des entraînements. À la corde, des séries de 1000. Un quart d'heure à sauter à toute vitesse et sans ressentir la moindre fatigue. Il riait et au sac, des séries de sans pair de toutes ses forces. Gauche droite, gauche droite, gauche droite. Et les jabs, par série de dix, répétées dix fois chacune, d'abord à gauche, puis à droite. Rien que d'y penser, cela lui déclenchait des envies de taper. Il aurait pu monter en poids avec cette puissance, mais chez les super légers, il a la vitesse et la puissance. Il chercha dans ses souvenirs le nom de celui qui avait gagné l'or. Il avait de plus en plus de difficultés à se souvenir des noms. Il fut un temps où il aurait répondu à la seconde. Beau mille, oui, beau mille, non. Beau humile, voilà comment il s'appelait. Non, non, beau humile, c'était son prénom. Nemechek. Beau humile, Nemechek. Un bon technicien, Nemechek. Sans plus, pas un cogneur. Lui était les deux, technicien et cogneur. En finale, il aurait gagné ses crochets du gauche. Si quelqu'un en encaissait un, il allait au tapis en train express. Paf C'était tout son corps qui pivotait d'un seul bloc. L'épaule, le cou de plié à l'équerre, le bras, et dans son prolongement parfait, le poing. Un bloc d'acier. Voilà ce que c'était un crochet de carazine, un bloc d'acier qui allait à la vitesse d'un train express. <rire> Cela dit, il s'était fait entourlouper comme un bleu par un crétin qui soudain avait pris la fausse garde, la bêtise d'une vie. Après quoi, prof de gym à l'école 65 de Viborg, au lieu de se retrouver entraîneur de l'équipe nationale. Sacrée carrière. 30 ans à faire courir des mauviettes. Heureusement qu'il avait pris sa retraite. Des PD, voilà ce que c'était devenu les garçons en Russie. Ce pays allait au diable. Mais maintenant, cette journaliste qui voulait le voir à propos de l'Evachov, mais il n'avait pas honte, ces gens, de passer leur temps à cracher sur leur patrie. Thank you very much for the reading. Ah, voilà le passage. Bon, ça sera pour après. Um, and for all those who couldn't follow it, um, maybe we'll, we can translate later. But I, I'd like to um, maybe introduce the book in a few lines and then ask you why you chose this specific passage. Um, the whole story takes place or commences. The first part of the novel starts in 1937 uh, during the Bolshevik regime, the Soviet regime loots, sells, destroys the Russian Orthodox churches uh, and kills um, thousands and hundreds and thousands of priests or monks are killed, murdered. And um, if you look at the um, description of this period, it's called the, uh, the Great Terror, the, the Great Terror of Stalin. Um, I think anywhere between 100 and 150 and 500? You'll know the exact number of churches that are destroyed. No. Uh, more, 100,000 100, 100, churches are destroyed. And um, a, th a, a thousand uh, monasteries closed.
closed, Doesn't not destroyed. Closed? <coughs> not, dis not destroyed because they wanted to use them as gulags for, for their hospitality services. You know. So some of the monks managed to run away and hide in the uh, forests. And this specific monk, an imaginary one, I mm -hmm. presume, um, um, Nicodim, Nicodim Kirilenko, uh, decides that he will save the uh, treasures of the Orthodox Church. And in order to save those treasures, he gathers around him other priests who have been running around in the forest hiding. And together, 12 priests, or 12 monks, vow to save those treasures at, at any price. And among those priests, there's one, uh, an acrobat. And he teaches the other monks how to jump high, how to um, climb over fences. And so together they manage to gather uh, all those looted. They, start, they actually start looting themselves, going to churches and collecting um, the, the icons, collecting the treasures of the church which they, uh, they hide. Uh, Nicodem, who's a very difficult person, um, eventually, I won't tell you the whole story, but eventually he takes it on himself when, when finally um, the government or the, uh, the police discovers or, or thinks um, uh, they have discovered who, who did the looting, who did the stealing from the stealers. It's, it's like a, um, a Russian version of Robin Hood, if you want. Um, um, he takes it all on himself. He said he did, a, he did it with a few partners that have died. Actually, some of the partners uh, fell over a fence in one, in one accident. And um, so he is, he's put in prison. Uh, this is uh, the first part of the novel. The second part of the, of the novel uh, takes place in, in France in the year two th around the year 2000. And um, uh, we meet uh, Mathias, Mathias Marceau. Um, who's a photographer, he's a top model photographer. And um, Matthias, one day during an exhibition of his, um, finds out that his, his father has just uh, passed away. And um, not only has he passed away, but he, he's asked a Russian Orthodox burial. And Matthias is astonished to find out that this is his father's last wish. Um, I'll spare you the details for the moment, we'll speak about them later, but with this discovery of um, his father's last will, he also discovers, almost despite him, the past, the past of his family, which lead back to Nicodem. Nicodem is actually his grandfather and his beloved grandmother, Irene, Irene, who came from a small village in France, is actually discovered to be not a French woman, but a Russian woman whose uh, warm heart belonged to Russia until the end of her life, and he discovers it in a very, very special manner through uh, a uh, present, a gift his father leaves him, a bonheur du jour, which is a uh, sort of uh, a uh, lady's writing desk, mirtava in Hebrew, uh, where he discovers um, a small note or a letter from his grandmother to his father and to posterity and the family. He now has to go back and confront the family's past. And this path leads back to Russia and back to the rediscovery of this hidden loot, the hidden treasures of the Russian Orthodox Church. I hope I did okay in Perfect. <laughs> resuming the story. Bravo, bravo. And so, um, why did you choose this specific passage from the book? Oh, because <laughs> I... I, I I just liked very much this character. He's completely crazy. There must be an autobiographical uh, <laughs> dimension in this selection. <laughs> uh, I used to, to practice boxing when I was a teenager. And I, I uh, that's, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a sad story. I mean, it's a paradox. Everything, anything which is not a paradox in a novel is totally uninteresting. You would agree with it. Absolutely. And this is a paradox because obviously the, the regime of the USSR was very harsh, but um, 
you, you go there today and you meet many people who believe that, okay, it was harsh, but in a sense, they kind of all live decently, more or less decently. Especially under the Brezhnev years, starting with Khrushchev, and then the Brezhnev years, and and it's it's very paradoxical because you you have in, in Russia today there is an incredible religious revival, and these same people who could not practice religion will tell you that they are nostalgic about this regime and the fact that it kind of more, as I said, more or less took care, take care of more or less everybody, more or less well. It was not fantastic, but it was decent. And what you see today is indecent situations. Uh, so it's, it's a little strange to, to, to meet these people, um, but they exist and uh, I thought Karazin is a, is a perfect uh, incarnation of, of this uh, paradox. So there's a lot of uh, missing, uh, in Hebrew we say gagua, uh, um, I don't think this word really exists in other languages. Longing. It's longing. There's, there's a longing for a past. Uh, for, for Nicodem, it's the longing of the oh, past. Or the, he's he's about to lose, or the present he's about to lose. The, the, the Russian Orthodox he's, he's part of. For uh, Andre, 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 uh, 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 Matthias, uh, Matthias's father, Nicodem's son. Um, um, it's the longing to a life that his father and his mother supposedly lived. Well, I I don't know. Honestly, I don't know. One of the things that I want to say is that I don't always know what my characters think. And they are free to think what they want. <laughs> um, I don't think that's, that's the main um, problem with Matthias. The, Matthias is, okay, the past of his parents or grandparents was not what he was told. But had he known this past to start with, there would be no problem. His problem is that he was lied to. His problem was that he lived in a secret. And this is, of course, uh, a perfect way to, to, to destroy someone's life. And make an interesting and character. Make an interesting and make an interesting yeah, character. Yeah, I, I was. Th this would probably be a great transition point to uh, allow Evan Fallenberg to introduce his novel because I think in in your novel, Dancing on Water, the question of lying or not exactly telling or talking about the past is a major issue. Uh, in your book, um, Mr. Arditi, I think that uh, it is very clear that you are. Matthias is being lied to. It has not been told what his past or his family's past was, but as Evan will soon tell you, um, it's about people not wanting to mention or talk about their past and wanting to... Just, could, just sorry. if I may yes. just add one thing yes. before you, you, you step in. He was lied to, Matthias, but for those reasons that you just mentioned, that is to say, Sometimes you lie to your children because you want to protect them. You don't want to put them in front of what you went through. And there is no way that a lie does not uh, have uh, an impact and, uh, and usually uh, a very destabilizing impact on, on someone's uh, personality. And if I just may add that, Matthias, my character, was a fantastic photographer. He won prizes. He was brilliant. And the day, this is 10 years before he steps into the novel, the day he senses, he senses that there is something wrong 
that there is a that there is a lie in his family when his supposedly grandfather is dying and his supposedly grandfather says about his father he I loved him like my son and he laughs he said but he was your son he took care of me like he was my son he took care he of me, me like, like he me. was my but son. he was my he was but your he son and then he dramatically changes profession because a, a real photographer goes deep into the truth enters his subject and kind of takes him back lifts him consoles him what he did was to start a, a, being a photographer for models. Fashion. fashion photographers cover the truth with the dresses, but generally they, they have a, a work which is maybe very interesting, very aesthetic, but they are far away from the truth. They don't face the truth. And so that, at that time, he changed profession because he was fleeing the truth. He, he wanted to look without seeing. He, he voilà. was fleeing away from the truth. And, and at one point, I think it is Jason, his fr photographer friend, asks him, tell me, when you take a picture of one of your top models, do you remember what she looks like five minutes after she's left the, the floor? And he thinks, and he, he says, hell no, no. To himself, he says, no, I don't. So, and... Um, I would remember, but that doesn't <laughs> <laughs> it's not in the book? Huh? No, he would remember. I, as a person, you, you would I remember. remember. He would remember the model. You would, would remember, remember the, the top model. model. Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Of course, unforgettable. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, th th there's a very um, symbolic act. Polia, his uh, Russian mistress and lover, receives from him. She, she's not at all model looking. And um, his first, um, uh, Polia is the woman who helps him trace back uh, the people who help him uncover the treasures. She's his Russian translator and guide in Russia. And um, he, his first gesture towards her is to offer her, to give her one of his photography book of top models. And uh, her first gesture is to throw it to the nearest, in the nearest garbage can. Um, and with it, she also throws, I think, some kind of um, conception he has of his life of looking away from things. He will now start looking into his his family's past life. Now, turning to your novel, Evan, uh, When We Danced on Water, maybe maybe we can introduce it in a few words. I'll introduce it as a reader of the novel, and then you can uh, correct me. <laughs> and then, um, uh, it all starts with, in the present, actually, not in the past. Um, um, we're in Tel Aviv, around our time, I think. Yeah. Around our time. And we come across two people. We come across Vivi, Vered, Vivi, um, who's a lovely 40-year-old uh, uh, lady, an Israeli, uh, unmarried, um, has a family, but not her own uh, nuclear, uh, nuclear family. And uh, Vivi lives in Tel Aviv, loves Tel Aviv. But the reader can sense, I think, right from the beginning that she's holding on to some kind of secret or a past life. She's not too keen on discussing with other people. And Vivi is an artist of all sorts. I think that her art moves anywhere from arts to crafts. We know that she's working at a bar. She's a, um, a waitress at a bar, a local bar. She seems to think of it as a permanent job, uh, yet she's, she's an artist of all genres, I think you would say. Um, and uh, Vivi comes across one of the, um, I would say, the permanent um, visitors of the cafe, one, one who becomes a permanent visitor of the cafe, Theodore, Theo, Theo, Theodore Levi, Levin. Uh, director of uh, the Israeli ballet, the, 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 the Tel Aviv, the non-existent, the non-existent Tel Aviv ballet. ballet yes. We wish. Um, who's been a dancer um, when he was young? Um, a very talented young man who um, moved from Poland to Denmark in order to study ballet. 
Um, he was meant to be uh, to have a brilliant career as a dancer, not just as a choreographer. And uh, his career was brought to a halt uh, because of the, uh, the beginning of the uh, Second World War. Uh, and uh, I think he'll say more about that. But he was held captive in Berlin for a few years, and that sort of brought an end to him as a dancer, though he does become a choreographer. But when Vivi and Theodore meet, both of them seem to be a little stuck. Vivi is a waitress who doesn't know where she will go, and Theodore, for over 10 years now, he's not had any new ideas about um, choreography. So maybe you can take from here. Okay. I hope I did an Thank okay Thank you. Job. Yeah, that's, that's fine. I'd like to say a word before I read um, two short passages. I'd like to say a word about um, the question that you brought up uh, right from the beginning, and that is characters, characterization. And are our characters empty shells, and should we leave them as empty shells? And uh, I, I feel very emphatically that no. I think that um, a writer who works hard and puts together good characters does the exact opposite, fills those shells so that they are as real as anybody that you could ever meet. I, I think all of us, I hope all of us, have had the experience of reading a good novel and at the end either feeling like they've gained a new friend or enemy, however you, you felt about the characters, or at least somebody you would like to know better. And and uh, so so that's it's kind of a mystery to me, this, this thought. I, I, I go to great, great lengths to get to know my characters well. Um, I was <laughs> discussing this a little bit before Beforehand, in order, in or, in, yes, I do. Um, in order to um, to understand this, uh, the male character here better, uh, Teo, uh, I wound up taking two years of ballet lessons so that I could feel in my body. I didn't need two years worth, but um, the, I got carried away. But I, I wanted to be able to feel in my body what he would feel, so that when I wrote something from his perspective, it would be as real as possible. And, and and there again, you know what? Maybe just the fact that I did wind up studying uh, ballet for two years shows that it goes beyond just trying to create something to fill a shell. It's something so much more solid than that. Um, so can, I, can I just mm -hmm. add something to what you said? I totally agree with what you said. But and my question, oh. no, no, I totally agree okay. with every word you said. My question is, how is someone as knowledgeable as Natalie Saud, right? such nonsense. <laughs> that was a rhetorical great. question that I don't even have to answer. No, for God's that's, sake. That's great. Let's forget about this. Yes. Because this is really, it has been discarded long since. But at one point in time, it was kind of chic yeah. to raise this kind of question. Right. It make no sense right. whatsoever. No, no. <laughs> but, but, but let me let me just be honest with you. I've, I've only read part of the passage. The other part was to look for the character in other places, and those other places would be the infinite movements of the character's consciousness. So she didn't completely discard with the, with no, the but character. No, but all that is so theoretical. It's made no <laughs> sense. It's bullshit. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know about the rest of them. you, but the, when, when I read a novel, <laughs> I, I want a good story, right. good characters, right. and lovely language to support those two. So uh, if we agree on that, then I'll read. Um, I'm going to introduce you to uh, my two main characters, Vivi and then Teo, just short passages. Vivi needs no introductions because this is basically when you meet her in the novel. Uh, Teo needs a little bit of introduction. I'll just tell you that when you meet him in this passage, the present story, he's 85, living in Tel Aviv. But the passage in which you'll meet him, he's 17. It's uh, September 1st, 1939, which most of us know as the uh, first, uh, the, the, the opening of the first, uh, Second World War. But nobody knows that yet. What he knows is that he is having his big dance premiere with the Royal Danish Ballet on the Staatsoper stage in Berlin. And uh, what happens just before the scene that I'm going to read with him is that um, Germany's invasion of Poland has been announced, and his family is back in Warsaw. So just as he's about to have his grand debut, he's worried about his family back in Warsaw. Okay, so first Vivi and then Theo. When Vivi leaves the coffee bar, she never takes the short, direct route home. First, in nearly any weather, she steps outside the shopping arcade, parks herself on the nearest bench, a slatted wooden affair that the Tel Aviv municipality occasionally paints green, and smokes one of the three daily cigarettes she allows herself. 
She stretches her legs out as far as they will go, wriggles her toes, watches passers-by and birds, and enjoys each deep inhalation of her Winstons. When she has had her fill of smoking and looking, she rises slowly as if with regret and chooses a direction. Sometimes she will walk to the right because the woman who has just by walked by was wearing a beautiful pair of shoes. And sometimes she will walk to the left because there are a few clouds in that direction. There are days when she closes her eyes and spins round, then chooses left or right, and days when she stands waiting for a sign, any sign, and does not move until that sign appears. It always does, though once it took a full five minutes, during which a little boy stopped to ask if she were lost. Then she begins her perambulations, wending her way from street to street in concentric, uneven circles. She walks eastward down Kaplan Street, past the peak-roofed houses with flower boxes built by the Templars, toward Azrieli Center, where she bends her head backward to stare at the edge of the triangular tower as it spikes the sky. She walks north to the open emptiness of Rabin Square. She walks west under the ficus trees, dangling vines like moss to the shade of the Royal Poinciana's in Masaryk Square. And mostly, she walks south, where Tel Aviv really happens. She has what she calls her theme walks, still capricious, but with a motif. So there is scent walk, where she picks up on the smells of coffee and steamed milk, falafel and shaved lamb's meat, hyssop seasoning and roasting cashews and coriander and chicken on a spit, and even certain people leaning into their wakes as they pass. There is foliage walk, for noticing and naming the great many flowering plants she encounters. There are Jewish walks, mostly at holiday times when she counts stars of David and synagogues and orthodox passersby and Chabad emissaries and old men selling skull caps on overturned orange crates. She has graffiti walks and merchandise walks and architecture walks and people walks. Her most frequent are baby walks, featuring soft, cuddly babies of every color and size and women with bellies in various stages of pregnancy. On bad days, she has ugly walks, dog shit on the sidewalk, people spitting, honking cars, the junkies and pimps near the old central bus station. No matter what kind of walk she is having, though, she's aware of the stunning, relentless blue sky and green leaves nearly all year round. She wanders past old stores, Zion the Tailor, Madame Julie's Institute of Beauty, a hardware star, a store offering Hebrew labor, and shiny new places, their names written in English only. She cuts through parking lots and apartment buildings and hotels in order to reach back streets. She emerges at the seashore and traverses beach after beach, each with its own crowd and style. There are people she waves at along her way, some whom she knows, some just because they seem pleasant. And at times she stops to exchange a word about the weather or the traffic or a cute baby or an elegant dress. She talks more to women than to men, since the men usually misinterpret her, in her intentions. But children get more of her attention than anyone else. She walks like this for an hour, sometimes two, until finally she has had her fill of the city and can go in peace and silence to her apartment. Behind him, without looking over his shoulder, he knew the corps de ballet stood posed in small, asymmetric groups. Close ahead and below were the musicians, just completing the cadences that ushered him to this place at the center of the stage. And all around him and ahead and above him as well were 2,000 faces, white, groomed and plumed, plucked and shaved and oiled. Men in uniform, women in feathers and fur, all sparkling with pleasure and confidence, their faces hungry with anticipation like baby birds. For a small moment, Theodore considered these faces, all assembled here to watch him spin and leap through three minutes of trifling Danish music. But as he planted his feet, as he pulled his torso high above his legs, as he rotated his head slowly, slowly to the left and floated his arms gently into place, the dancers and the musicians and the audience disappeared. Theodore was alone with his body, poised. He could hear the sound of his breathing, slow and deliberate, could feel the pulse of blood coursing to his toes and fingers. The orchestra sounded the last chord to his introduction, the grand pause that would end only when Theodore broke the spell of silence. The conductor turned his attention to Theodore on stage. The hall fell completely silent in watchful anticipation, but Theodore was in no hurry. Here it was, this moment. A moment of infinite space, as if he had squeezed his way through a tight, dark tunnel and found himself at this spot, unfurled. This moment of infinite possibility, too, of ways to travel or not. He could stop right now, crawl back into his safe tunnel. He could freeze, fail to move, crumple. He could rotate his head straight forward toward the musicians in the audience and scream insults at them in Polish. Worst of all, he could dance badly. The audience, the musicians, the dancers, 
They were waiting for him to move. He knew this moment had gone on too long. He must give the signal to the conductor, and he wished to. He was looking forward to his dance, but he was enjoying this moment of all possibilities too much. He had sensed what he would know to be true only many years hence, that this bubble of freedom and floating would be his last, that he would tumble headlong to one destiny, settling, setting his future, one certain future in motion. He knew that the moment he moved his foot, something would have changed, and there would be no return. At the end of this moment, his moment and no one else's, as his right leg steeled itself to support his weight, as his head craned upward from his neck in a tiny, imperceptible gesture, as his toes strained the cloth of his slippers, as the audience and the musicians and the dancers breathed as one with him, Theodore understood with great clarity, as if remembering that he would dance without a flaw, knew this would be the most perfect dance of his life, in fact, its pinnacle that at seventeen and a half his body would spin, stretch, and soar, that there was nothing he could not do. Now he was ready, and with a touch of melancholy mixed with the unbridled excitement of youth, he sent a wordless farewell to his moment, pointed the toes of his left foot as taut as a freshly sharpened pencil, and sailed into the music. So this is the moment prior to uh, what we will later know as the, the moment where he was held captive uh, by a German um, soldier who was fascinated by this amazing dance, his best dance ever, and who will um, be in some way responsible for um, for Theo's um, what would I call identity issues right. later on in life. So here we come to, to one issue that, well, we spoke with uh, Mr. Arditi, we spoke just prior to this, um, uh, to this um, uh, meeting, a discussion, um, Mr. Arditi told me, um, hold on, and the way you described this uh, meeting, everything's okay, but the word identity, what do you mean by identity? Uh, because identity can be quite an explosive thing, you know, if we start speaking about Israelis, Palestinians. This could be quite an issue. Maybe some of you will leave the room angrily. So this is not where I went. I was... Please uh, stay. Please stay. <laughs> We've been so... Even if you're angry. <laughs> Even if you're angry. No, but... <laughs> please do, because I think that in both books, and this is where I'm coming to, identity is an issue, whether the characters, whether um, Matthias or Theo or Vivi wanted or not, they're bound to have these problems. It has been um, imposed upon them by um, their past, by their relatives. And uh, so maybe we, you can say a word about that and maybe you can contradict me later on. Well, one thing I, that we certainly have in common is that we both were uprooted or uprooted ourselves from our original culture and language and nation and came to a new place. And I think that anybody who's ever done that, and that probably includes some of you in this room as well, um, you know that that forces you at whatever age to grapple with identity. Who are you? I mean, the minute that I moved to Israel, I became an American because that's the way Israelis treat me. So um, I had to grapple always with n never really having felt completely like an American in America and then finding myself here in Israel called Ha'amerikai. And so what is my identity then? Am I an American? Am I an Israeli? How long does it what take me? How long does it t take me to become an He's Israeli? He's going where we didn't want him to. <laughs> and and um, and uh, and then add to that, of course, you know that we have a whole other identity. If we're Jewish or Muslim or Christian, that's you know that's an, that's another whole identity to grapple with. So, so if if you're dealing with these issues personally, they're obviously going to come out in in literature. But but. I'm not sure they come out straightforward. I mean, no, no. In, in, uh, for instance, if you that's why I write fiction and not nonfiction. Oh, I don't okay. want to do straightforward. I want to, I want to explore. I want to create characters and situations, and then explore. And I think you said something like this as well. That when I start to write, I don't know exactly what I'm writing. I don't know why I'm writing this particular story. I know that I have a story. I know that I need to tell it. And as I'm telling it, I learn what the story is really about. And frankly, for me, what's happened is the only thing that's gotten a little bit easier now working on my my fourth novel is that um, I'm more aware 
of my hidden intentions today than I was with novels one, two, and three. Um, it's taking me a little less time to figure out what the hell it is that I'm actually dealing with in a, in a given book. Yeah. Uh, you, I, did, I don't think I said that I don't know why I write. I said that I don't know what my character is doing. Uh, yeah. Ah, yeah. That's, that's a, a very different, different thing. Right. Yeah. So why do you write? <laughs> to understand what he thinks. Okay. So you want to find out. That's exactly the... To, to, the, the to understand what he thinks, what the, he thinks the, character. the character thinks. What he thinks and what in general. If you want my, my very quick answer to this very important question. Um, I think that the definition of writing, writing means listening. If you don't <coughs> listen to your characters, there is no book, there is no novel, <laughs> there is nothing interesting. If you start inventing and say, okay, I think he's going to say this and this and that, and you don't listen, you don't take the time. Now, in real life, who takes the time? We don't take the time. We're in a hurry. I'm, I'm waiting impatiently to take off the... Uh, you know, avion here and see what I have <laughs> on my iPhone, what messages have come. I'm, I'm in a rush, you are in a rush. You are in a, you're taking a plane to Istanbul. <laughs> she has to leave at 1.15. In real life, we are under pressure. We don't take time, we don't listen. And the heart of life is to listen to the other is to be there for the other, is to exchange, to receive love and give love. And what I, for me, writing is a lesson in living. Unfortunately, I don't learn lessons. I forget my lessons. That's why you write I, another novel. I have, I have a, a feeling at one point in time that, yes, I have done something, j'ai fait un bout de chemin with that character. And then I, I'm my old self again, impatient, intolerant, judgmental, what have you. So this is why I write, because writing is a, is an, a long, stretchable instant in life where you have the illusion of being someone better than you're actually. Mm. Do you see any connection between your philanthropic work and... Uh Right, between your philanthropy, philanthropical activities, and writing? Probably there is, but uh, I... Probably there is, because it, again, it's something that I try to do... I, I, I try to, to be a little better than I'm actually. I mean, it's all a matter of cheating, you know? <laughs> I, I have, a, I have a, a little different perspective on it. Um, I'd say, uh, this, I think I... I, I fine-tune this with um, a dialogue that went on between me and uh, a, f a fellow writer um, some years ago where we talked about the artistic aspects of what we do and the therapeutic aspects of what we do. That, that writing in one sense is art and what, writing in another sense is therapy. And in the end we kind of discovered that uh, while she, her, her goal in writing fiction was therapy, self-therapy, understanding herself. She was in the process creating art. Mine was exactly the opposite. And that was, my goal was to create art. It was my, it, it's my means of, of express, expressing something creatively where somebody else would make a sculpture or write a symphony. It's my way of, of creating art. Through my art though, there is therapy, and um, I, I don't use that word lightly. I, sometimes I think when we workshop stories in a creative writing class that what we're really doing is psychotherapy on a, a group psychotherapy on a patient that's lying in, 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 in the middle of the room. But, um, but what I mean by that is really self-discovery, and I think that the, the American writer John Updike said this beautifully once. He said um, that fiction is the most... Um, efficient method of self-discovery and self-exposure yet in cre created by mankind. And it's amazing when you think it really should be non-fiction when somebody writes an autobiography or a memoir. But 
I find, now that I'm working on my fourth novel without ever an intention to write any character that is Evan Fallenberg, mm -hmm. I have written four novels that have pieces of me cut up and mashed into them in all kinds of different ways that I myself can't even identify. I, you, you may get this question as well sometimes on book tours, that is, how much of your novel is true? And I always want to say 16% or 67% or nothing or 100%. I have no idea how to answer that because all of those answers I just gave you were absolutely true. Absolutely true. Depending on how you look at what I'm doing, how I look at what I'm doing. I have a slightly different uh, uh, approach. Uh, it's not a matter of percentage, but there is a general rule that when someone reads a book, my book, your book, they will try to discover what is your own uh, component in the book and systematically systematically the approach is to look into the details of the characters lives right. to discover the author exactly. and this is completely wrong <laughs> what is important is the look of the writer on the characters right. this is something that the writer, this is a, 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 an element on which the writer cannot cheat. Because you look, you look at things as, as you look at things. You cannot cheat them. Uh, and so the, the uh, obvious, uh, you know, Picasso said, I, I spend my time doing my self-portrait. Voilà. So he, he, he painted many different things. In, in, lit, in French literature, before writing novels, I thought that the word uh, by Flaubert, Madame Bovary, c'est moi, I thought it was just a mot d'auteur, you know? Yeah. And now I see that it's absolutely true for every character. You put yourself, whether you want it or not, in every right. character. Of course, it's not always the same biographical line because it would be boring, so you invent. But you put yourself in the character, and uh, sometimes it's more difficult, sometimes it's easier. You have all sorts of characters. I, uh, I've gone through that. But the, the look that you have, yeah. this look uh, unveils your, yeah. your, your true person. Do you ever write in the first person? Am I allowed to ask questions too? Of course, please do. The, the whole idea was that you interact. <laughs> do, you, do you write in the first person? I, I try not to. Mm -hmm. I try Why? not to precisely because I, I have to, to, to keep a, a certain distance with, um, with, my, uh, with my characters and also for, for a technical reason. That is to say, when you write in the first person, uh, you cannot go into the other yeah. character's uh, mind. mind, and it's kind of... Uh, it's limiting, it's limiting. It's, it's limiting. I, uh, the uh, book you had before, Loin des Bras... The, I think it's here? No, it's no, 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 here. it's not here. You uh, have it, no, I, Loin des Bras. I, I, it's, uh, the, the thickest one I wrote, I first wrote it in the first mm -hmm. person. And then you changed the whole and thing. Then I really wow. it was completely because I, um, I also have tried to stay away from writing in the first person. I don't want to write in the first person. And this novel I'm working on now, my fourth, uh, I realized that the character in my dialogue with him, the main character, he was pushing himself and pushing himself. It was clear to me that he was demanding yeah, a first person, person novel. So I let him. I decided I'd, I'd experiment with it. <laughs> and uh, you, you raise your eyebrow like, oh, I, I, you want, to, I want No, I want to... to I'm impatient to hear the end of the phrase. Okay, what so happened? so what happened was uh, I was thinking about this novel for 18 months without writing a word of it. Okay, I was busy with other things. I wasn't prepared to work on this novel yet. Not a word. I had an opportunity this fall. I had a, a fellowship in the United States where I had to do nothing but sit and write, and they took care of me, meals, accommodations, everything I needed. Right, um, and when I got there. In the first 10 days that I was there, I wrote in such a fury, so on fire, that I wrote the entire draft of this novel, uh, 45,000 words in those 10 days. I've never had that experience before, 
and I can't help thinking that maybe it had something to do with, with writing in the first person, which I've never let myself do before, and that um, I had I was sitting on a I was sitting on something very explosive. I was sitting on it for 18 months until it finally you know but exploded. I, I don't know your fourth novel, but I'm just raising the question maybe. You would not do that at every novel. No, definitely you not. Know? Definitely because it, not. sometimes you're very close to a character. That was I, what I was saying before. Sometimes you're very close and bang, it goes like that. Sometimes you just have to uh, to, to take stock, take a distance, yeah. and 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 uh, wait. In in this book, Loin des Bras, uh, there is one very short section. One uh, takes place in a in a boarding school in Switzerland. And uh, one of the teachers, uh, teachers of math and, and physics, is of French origin. It, it takes place in '59. He was born uh, in between the two wars, and then he went to. He was born in the colonies in, in, in Indochina. He goes to France in between the two wars, and during the Second War, he becomes. Well, he was not. He becomes anti-Semitic, and. At one point, I, I, I try to get into him so that he can justify to himself mm -hmm. anti-Semitism. You want to read the passage? I, I may have uh, sit. I may have gone to my desk twenty-five times to try without and find being it. without being able mm -hmm. to, to, to do it because. It, it was contre nature. <laughs> and finally, I did it. <coughs> finally, I did it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm glad that by doing it, I still kept my empathy for that character. I didn't lose my empathy for that character. The, the reader will have his own judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, but this character was not all bad. He was just anti taken in a, in a fury of anti-Semitism, uh, which took place in France uh, during the Second World War, right. as you know. Uh, well, you may be you may be right about that. I, I don't want to make any confessions here about how close I am or not close I am to this character that I'm writing. I'll get myself in big trouble. He's not he's not a lovable character. Let's put it that way. Um, so but, it's truly autobiographical. <laughs> you know me so well already. Um, so, but but there is yeah there is something. I, I ask myself the same question, and you know what? It doesn't even matter how close how close he is to me. I think what's important is how close I feel to his story, how close I am to, you know, getting to, to know him. And that, that goes right back to that, 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 that question about, you know, characters. If we don't know our characters really exceptionally well, then we'll never be able to, to write them well and make anybody else believe them. I would go one step further. We don't really never, we, we never know our characters. We approach them. I have my idea is that the only uh, person, if I may say so, who should write novels is God, because God knows the human heart. We don't know the human heart. Who are we to know the human heart? We try, we try, we listen, we wait. But that's so we why we write novels. That's God doesn't why, need exactly, to. Exactly, exactly. That's why we write novels. Uh, and, and to write is to listen and to, to try to understand better the persons who are around you in everyday yeah. life and that you don't treat as well as you should because we are very imperfect. I'd like to play the uh, devil's advocate again. I'm sorry, because we've been speaking about characters and you've completely convinced me that Sarot was utterly <laughs> was wrong. Sota. And and I don't I didn't even need you to tell that because I Sota exactly. <laughs> What, what would the good translation for a little time? Never mind. <laughs> Sorry, never mind. Uh, but no, no. But seriously, so so characters do um, when they're well approached, do attract our attention and remain with us, not just with you uh, writers, but sure. with the readers. But let me suggest that when reading your two novels, your two respective novels, I think that uh, I came across at least two other protagonists that are not characters. One was, or is art itself in its various forms and manifestations, 
for you, Evan, it's dance, but also what um, Teo says, Vivi and all her scattering with different arts, but it's also photography, the way Vivi puts together the um, exhibition where Teo sees the photo with um, Freddie, his one time... Um, Don't okay. tell too much. <laughs> I can't, you'll have to read it, okay. And um, with you, uh, Mr. Arditi, I think it's the, um, well, first of all, we have a photographer, but we also have the father of the photographer, a carpenter, so we're here anywhere between arts and crafts. Um, and the paintings. The, and the, the paintings, the, the amazing icons, uh, Russian, beautiful Russian Orthodox icons. Um, Andrei Andre, uh, paints and leaves for A and K, is it A and K or a or K, I'm not sure about the initials anymore, but someone, he sends them to, uh, some mysterious person he sends them to in Russia. Uh, and they're all intended to be restored and uh, put in the Russian newly new born new churches. So there's a whole history of art within your writing. So this, this would be one protagonist, and the other would be uh, those things that are created, the objects, the status of the photograph, the icons, le bonheur du jour, etc., etc. So maybe you can elaborate on that, both of you. <laughs> It's the same thing as writing, you know. Art is one way to, for someone to understand oneself. It goes for the writer, but of course it goes for the reader. Uh, when, when you read a, a book and there is a character, and you get into the character, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a rather tricky way of getting to know yourself without going on the couch of a psychoanalyst and having to face yourself, which can be painful. There you kind of turn around, on tourne autour du pot. But basically it's the same trip that you take and when you look at someone who is playing uh, on scene in the theater or you go to the movies or you, go, you see a ballet or a painting, you identify with a dancer I mean, a dancer who has no emotion, who, sh who shares, who doesn't share his emotions, is not a dancer, he's a gymnastic uh, player, uh, athlete. And, and I think, I mean, it, it comes uh, not as a, as a strategy, but naturally as a complement to writing. It's just one way that we have to, to, to understand each other in a more, uh, straightforward, paradoxically, way than psychoanalysis because it goes faster. And, uh, and it's always, I mean, the same, the same thing. It's very difficult for someone to go to, to the other one, aller vers l'autre, without having accepted and, and to accept yourself, you have to understand yourself. I, I use art in a different fashion, and that is, that's my inspiration for writing in, in many ways, especially in this book where I'm dealing with art, but in all of them. And for me, I'd say that the um, visual arts and dance are, are the arts that affect me most as a writer. They, they absolutely um, inspire me. And when I've been at, um, in situations where I've been like in, a, in, a, uh, in an artist colony, like the one I was describing in, in Vermont earlier this year, I tend to drift to, not so much to the other writers f for dialogue, but to the other um, visual artists and, and, and um, because they inform me. I, I can tell you, the, the scene that you referred to toward the end of When We Danced on Water, um, I was having terrible trouble s with, with a very important, pivotal scene at the end of the novel. I didn't know how to solve it. And I was in New York and I heard about an exhibit at the Paula Cooper Gallery, and I, I went to see this. I don't know why, I had a feeling it was going to be meaningful for me, but I went to see this exhibit, and um, it was an, a, a French artist, Sophie Cal, and I walked into the exhibit, <laughs> but before yeah. I even really absorbed, I walked into the ex exhibit, looked around, 
and I knew exactly how to solve the issue in my novel. It was wonderful. If you know, if you know Sophie, I see people. If you know Sophie Kahn, you remember that I she know had. Her you know her personally. Yep. Yeah, you can tell her that story then. Um, so she, the, the the exhibit was she had been jilted by her boyfriend, and he'd sent her a letter about this long, right. telling her yeah. why he was done with her. Right. And she it took that an letter. SMS. It was an SMS. <laughs> and she took the letter and gave it to 101 women of all different professions and asked them to react. And so you had a dancer, and you had a video artist, and you had a policewoman, and you had a psychologist, just everything you can possibly imagine. And uh, you know, maybe if, if, you, if you read my novel and you see the scene that I'm talking about, you will not make that connection. Maybe not at all. But for me, it was huge, walking in and seeing this particular exhibit. And then I, 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 I you know, became familiar with it. I, I, I walked around and learned it. But in that very first instant of walking in, I knew what I needed to do to solve the problem in my novel. And that, I, I've never been able to per personally thank her. So I'll ask you to do that <laughs> to thank her. for me. It's wonderful. I lunch <laughs> once with her uh, in my life, because she's uh, published by Actes Sud. And, uh, Sud. So in our one day we had lunch with her and uh, Françoise Nissen, the owner, mm. and she she talked about uh, those men who are real bastards because they break with an SMS. <laughs> <laughs> so so that was the real moment in life. <laughs> well, look what she, she made what great she, out of but, art out of it. Yeah, she should I mean, thank him uh, in the end. Yeah, I know. think she should. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. Well, I'll pass. Um, let me switch because you said you said something about visual art, about photography helping you solve this very difficult or pivotal moment of describing, of description. And this sends me back to what your last scene in uh, Les Moines, uh, La Confrérie des Moines Volants. Uh, am I allowed to, to mention the last scene? Because he. Sure. <laughs> sure. The last, in the last scene, we see um, Mathias with his camera taking a picture of a, a, a little boy, of a young boy, a teenager and an adolescent, um, who seems to be a little sad, and Matthias signals to the boy that he wants to take a picture Matthias of him. Matthias is on, on, in the station, in the railroad station of Kazan, and the train comes, and he's waiting for this train, and on the train, but separated by, by the glass, he sees a young boy. <clears throat> and the young boy has a coat and a large number attached. And this means that this young boy is being transferred either to an educational system or to an orphanage. Mm. And it's very sad. The, the young boy has, but the sadness of the boy the specificity of the sadness is that it's the sadness of an old man. Mm. That's the mm. terrible thing. It's not he's mm. sad like a young boy is sad. Mm. He has the sadness uh, and, and the despair of an old man. Vegetables. And so he, he grabs his camera. That's the end. I mean, he's, he has gone over the secrets of his family. He's getting closer to himself, to his true himself. He has been circling Russia for months taking pictures. And he grabs his camera and he takes four pictures in total. He takes one and the boy sees that he takes a picture and he asks to take another one and he takes a second one and he takes a third one. And as he finishes to take the third one, the train starts leaving. And the boy understands that because of him, he missed the train. And all of a sudden, he's full of joy, <laughs> and he makes Gives this gesture <laughs> that he takes on his camera. It's the little boy. And it was exactly what I, what I was uh, thinking of. So finally, he is again a true photographer, because a true photographer consoles his subject. Mm -hmm. He's with him, and he takes him out of out of sadness, yes. and so that's voila. <laughs> and so, and so, um, our time is almost over. So I wanted to finish with this specific scene, because um, you don't want to do that to us. No? <laughs> on, on the contrary, I want to do this to you. But before doing this to you, I would like, before thanking you, I would. 
I would like to say just a word on this scene as a reader, of course, it's reader's response here. As a reader, um, the train passes, he misses it, and we also see part of the picture. We don't know what the future holds, neither for the boy nor for Matthias, but we really, in a sense, do not need uh, more description because we've given enough elements to dream, to imagine, to long for as readers. Um, I think that I must give at least that to you, both of you here. You have um, returned, at least to me, the joy of reading characters. So I really, really want to, uh, reading and, and wanting to approach characters, not only as a writer, but as a reader. So I want to thank you both very much. And, and before clapping our hands, maybe we will, um, if there are any questions from the audience, I should have given you more time, but we have a few minutes for questions from the audience, questions and answers, of course. Um, Sylvia, maybe? Okay, okay. I see um, you. <laughs> just uh, one small uh, question, something that maybe wasn't brought up today. Uh, it's about uh, the organization of uh, time, the sequence. Uh, in your novel, we have a, uh, it goes from the past to the present, and there is a kind of ellipsis, which is not a real one. And in your novel, you have uh, going back and forth uh, between the past and the future. So, uh, is it, uh, could you tell something about this specific choice of uh, the organization of time and uh, sequences in your novel? I, yeah, I, I, in my case, well, especially with this novel, uh, when I went uh, to Russia, and uh, started with visiting uh, Levashovo. I don't know if some of you here know what Levashovo is. It was the mass graves. I had a very, very difficult time. And uh, I thought that I should not write on that, that I was not allowed. You know, there are many books on the Holocaust, and I regret it, because everybody takes the subject as a good subject uh, for commercial reasons. It's a sacred subject. and. Uh, I changed my, uh, that night I didn't sleep in St. Petersburg. I changed my mind maybe 10 times over three months. Then I said, okay, what I will do, I will take Matthias, I will start with Matthias, and I'm Matthias. Okay, Matthias has never gone to Russia, so he doesn't speak the language, he knows nothing. He discovers, it will be with my eyes. So I started writing with Matthias. And then I, I Several elements came into, into play. The first was that when you do flashbacks, you can never be as, as strong as when you describe something in direct. You know? It has to be shorter. You cannot do a flashback of 100 pages and then write 10 pages and then another flashback. The, the reader is lost. So my flashbacks were too weak given who Nicodem was and what he did. That's the first thing. The second thing, I thought of a word by Molière, who used to say, great writer, great actor, used to say, that a good actor uh, plays all roles. I said, I thought a good writer should be able to get into any character. And the third thing, and that at that time, I was already eight or nine or 10 months into my Russian trip. I was there all the time. I thought that I didn't know enough, but that my love for the subject would compensate my lack of expertise, and I started chronologically. Voila. I'll give a short answer to the, I know, I know we're short on time, um, and I'll say that I did exactly what you say one shouldn't do with this particular <laughs> book, and that is, um, front story and back story, and front story and back story. And the reason I was doing this was because I think really that the back story of both of these characters was pushing, weighing so heavily on them, pushing on them so hard that it, 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 while they were trying to tamp it down, it had to explode. So there were little yeah. bits of it, little bits of it, and then a because lot it of... it was the same characters. In my case, it was not the Different. same characters. Mm. You see, there is a difference. I see your So point. it's allowed? Yeah. <laughs> it, Should I, we vote? <laughs> I actually prefer that you You're say it's not allowed because I love breaking the rules. I'm a, I'm a good boy in usual life, but I love breaking the rules I'll in writing. i be very tough. It's allowed. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. <laughs>
Any other questions? So I'm sorry we're really a little short of time. on time. We got carried away with discussion here. So let me thank you again for coming here today. And I'm almost tempted to say entertaining us, but for making us think and approaching um, your characters, our characters in the future. Who knows? Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.